And then finally, how are these drinks made? And as Steven said, he's going to actually show a video of the actual production process. Steven works in a distillery every year and he's got video showing you from inside the distillery, he, the actual Toji he works with every year and just going step-by-step step through the process. Very, very detailed view of that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just give a brief overview of the production process. Also throughout this entire thing, I'm gonna one by one, we'll, we'll hit the different samples that you have in front of you. And we'll talk about what makes them unique and how they're normally enjoyed. Um, and we'll space them out throughout the presentation. So let me start with question number one. What are they? Well, Japan's best kept secrets, as I said before, and these are not some new trend. This is at least 500 years of distilling history. And they, you know, probably we can, we can safely say that Awamori is Shochu's uncle. It's a little bit older, probably. And Awamori is made in Okinawa Prefecture, almost exclusively. And then we have shochu, which is made all over Japan in every single prefecture. But the main area for shochu production is absolutely 110% Kyushu Island down in the Southwest. Uh, the biggest city on Kyushu Island is a wonderful city named Fukuoka, which is actually where Steven lives and where he is right now. Uh, I'm reporting to you live from Tokyo, where I have been since late 2002. Um, but so I'm a little bit removed from the, the epicenter of shochu, honkaku shochu, authentic shochu production, the traditional style, single distilled, um, but only a couple hours by, by plane. Now, these are not moonshine. They're definitely not fire water. You may be aware the bulk of shochu is, is bottled at 20% to 30% ABV. That's mostly a function or partly a function of the fact that it's single distilled in a pot still. So it naturally just has a lower um, still strength ABV. And it's definitely not, as I said, it's not moonshine, as trendy as that word has, been, has become. These are very, very carefully regulated drinks, uh, especially when considering how strict the, the shochu license is in terms of what you, you can use to make it and how it can be made and how it can't be made and the fact that no additives are allowed. And Finally, and this is what makes shochu such a fascinating and then also just a mind boggling drink is that it can really be made from dozens of natural ingredients. Now, awamori is, is very tightly restricted, just like sake is. Only rice can be used to make awamori from Okinawa. However, shochu, honkaku shochu, and the word honkaku, I keep using it repeatedly. Maybe Stephen can type it in, into the chat. Honkaku is the premium, authentic, old school shochu that people sip slowly. It's not, it's not a shooting drink. It's not something that you, 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 know, you dump it down really quickly. Um, it's, it's enjoyed with food and it can be made from all sorts of things like sweet potatoes, as we know, rice, barley, kokuto, uh, sugar, buckwheat or soba, and then a bunch of much more obscure ingredients like carrots or milk, uh, tea, seaweed, and dozens of other approved ingredients. Today, we're going to focus on the big ones, but it's an immensely diverse category with tremendous upside for, of course, the, the trade um, and I'm talking bartenders because there's so many flavors and aromas <laughs> available here, but also just to people trying to, you know, embellish their drinks program and find new ways to complement the, the food service at their establishment. Now, I said at the end of the last slide, you probably read it, I didn't mention it, but it's these ingredients and their koji, 
Now, I'm sure you've heard this word before. Uh, it's the magic behind Japanese food and drinks. Koji is a mold that turns starches into sugars, into fermentable sugars. And there's three main families of koji used in the shochu and awamori world. And they're pretty easy to remember because it's just yellow, black, and white. Um, now, yellow, as you, some of you may be aware, is pretty much what they use to make 99.99999% of sake. That's, what, that's what's used, yellow koji. Most shochu, however, uses white. And all awamori uses black, and it can only use black koji. Shochu, shochu has the most flexibility here in, in that they can use whatever type of koji they want. But it, it just so happens that white is the most common. And I think later Stephen will talk, when he's talking about the fermentation, he'll talk about why white and black koji are more common in distillation traditions in Japan than yellow. Now, before we get to our first tasting, um, I just want to talk about the inherent quality and history here. We've got four different GIs or geographical indications, just like AOCs or other things that are um, designating a, a protected indication or territory or pr uh, process. And the four GIs that are held by Japanese indigenous spirits are Satsuma Shochu, Ryukyu, Awamori, Iki Shochu, and Kuma Shochu. Um, now, Ryukyu, Awamori, it says Thai rice. And what that means is it's long grained rice from Thailand, generally, that's imported from Thailand. It's a holdover from the, the trade routes of, of yore. But it actually, the rule with awamori is simply that it must be made from rice. It doesn't have to be Thai rice, but 99, I'm going to say that the almost 100% is made from long grain Thai rice. All right. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about these four styles in terms of their ge geographic location. Um, and this is Kyushu Island here right up at the top. And then you can see the, the string of the necklace of islands falling down towards the, the southwest. And in the middle there is the Amami Islands, which are technically part of Kagoshima Prefecture, which is the brown, the brown prefecture on the southern part of Kyushu Island. And then if you go all the way down to the terminus, that's Okinawa Prefecture. And Okinawa Prefecture stretches almost clear to Taiwan. And on the left side, you can see we have Ikishochu from Nagasaki Prefecture, Kumashochu from Kumamoto, Satsuma Shochu from Kagoshima Prefecture and Ryukyu Awamori from Okinawa. And we're going to actually start at the second one down. Our first tasting is going to be Kuma Shochu from Kumamoto. And you're very lucky because you have one of my favorite rice shochus in front of you. And that is Toyonaga, Toyonaga Kura. And this is a lovely, very um, floral and fruity rice shochu that is made in the Kuma Basin, the, up in the mountains of southern Kumamoto. There are 27 distilleries up there that make this style. And it's a 100% ri traditional rice shochu style that is often made using vacuum distillation. And you can see all the vital details here. Uh, ingredients, and this will be the same for everything that we try today. There's going to be a primary fermentation and then a main fermentation. And the word for fermentation actually in Japanese is moromi, M-O-R-O-M-I, moromi. And that's a word that's used in the sake world as well. So the primary moromi in this case is rice koji. It's that koji mold that is propagated onto steamed rice and you get that to grow in there really deeply and the koji creates 
a couple of important enzymes that help to break those complex starch chains down into simple soluble, soluble sugars, namely glucose. And then, then you're ready for fermentation and you can add yeast and then you're off and running. So you have a starter fermentation, which is rice koji, and then a secondary fermentation, which is uh, rice without the koji added to it. 25% ABV. All of these are single pot distilled. So pot, pot still, you probably know it from the whiskey world. You've heard it before, but it's only used once. And this is fascinating. There are very, there are precious few drinks traditions, spirit traditions in the world that only distill once in a pot still. Most whiskey is, mm. uses at least two distillations. Um, mescal, it's by law, you have to use at least two distillations. Single distillation spirit is pretty rare when we're talking about pot stills. And the beauty of this is you get so much of the fermentation, the aromas, the flavors from, from that, you know, multiple, several week long fermentation are captured in the final, in the, in the distillate. It's a beautiful thing. And on this one, this is made from organic rice and it is lovely. It's got some fruitiness to it, a little, some, some ginjo qualities even, and it's, lovely by itself you could drink it neat it's really nice with some ice as it says at the bottom you can drink it mizuari which means ice plus some wa added water and then muddle it or stir it around a little bit or you could you know do something that looks a bit more like a highball that that's very refreshing as well so Christopher, like, yes go ahead if i may interrupt briefly it looks like this is actually sample number two just so people understand uh, thank you. we're going a little yeah. bit a little bit out of order uh, cool. And the reason we chose to do it in this order is because the vacuum distillate, next you'll try an atmospheric distillate and you'll see the, the contrast, even though they're both made from grains. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. So this, uh, this is sample two. If you mix them up, it's okay. Just don't drink it all one, at, in one go and uh, you'll be able to try it a few different ways. Notice that these drinks are flexible. So you can do it with cool, you can do it with hot. In some cases, hot water, we'll get to that in a moment. Oyuari, my favorite, favorite way to drink shochu is, you know, just a totally different experience. So you can try these a couple of different ways and figure out what works best for you. So that's, that's a quick and dirty introduction to um, rice shochu. A lot of rice shochu is vacuum distilled, which means that you're if you know anything about a pot still, you're reducing the pressure inside the still. The, the, the mash uh, boils at a lower temperature and you get a softer treatment of what's in, in that mash. The mash constituents are, they, I don't know, it's, a, it's more like a, you know, in a regular atmospheric pressure distillation, you got this really, really rambunctious boil inside the pot. And stuff is jumping out of there. You got things, you know, wafting off to collecting in the comb, uh, in the cone, and being brought off in the swan neck into the distillation chamber or into the con condensation chamber, I should say. Um, in a in a low pressure still, it's not so rambunctious. It's more like ballet, I think we'd say. It's a very light and much more elegant treatment of those flavors and aromas. Um, and if you ever try a, a, an atmospheric distilled rice shochu, you'll notice that it's very, very different. Okay, I'm gonna, while you're still enjoying that, I'm gonna go through this very quickly. Um, how do these things stack up? Sake, and, sake or nihonshu, which is the more appropriate term. Sake, as you may be aware, simply means alcohol in Japanese. So shochu is also sake, but it's okay. You can keep using the word sake. People understand what it means. Um, Sake is only brewed, it's not distilled. So there's a clear, there's the clear dividing line, okay? Yes, some shochu is made from rice and you're tasting some right now. However, uh, shochu can be made from dozens of ingredients and sake cannot. Both are made with koji. Um, sake tends to be between 14 to 18% alcohol. Shochu, rice shochu is almost always 25 to 30%. Uh, if it's undiluted, uh, 
undiluted distillate, it might go as high as like 43% alcohol, but for authentic shochu, due to Japanese shochu taxation law, it cannot go above 44.9% ABV, honkak shochu. Now, the confusing one, especially in the American market, is the Korean soju. That's thanks to California and a, a labeling loophole out there. And basically, they have, a, they have a very flexible soft license in California, whereby if you write soju on a label and you bottle at 24% ABV or less, then you can sell it on a soft on a soft license, you know, a beer and wine license. So there's a lot of shochu makers who since the 90s were a little bit lazy and they they were like, oh, we don't, well, this is an easy way to make sure we can get shochu into uh, sushi restaurants and other izakaya that don't have a full bar mm -hmm. license. And they would just write soju on there and sell it into those accounts. And obviously that creates a lot of confusion. How are they different? Soju does not use a pot still. <laughs> basically vodka um, that is watered way down and then has sweeteners. And it, it used to be, uh, they used to use straight sugar. There used to be various, it used to be aspartame was very common. These days it's a lot of stevia is used as a sweetener. They also use some acids um, to give it some extra body and a little bit of a sour note. It's got plenty going on. Um, served chilled, it's good with, you know, it's a good palate cleanser, it's consumed at pace, but it's, it's basically a, a sweetened vodka these days that is generally, the green bottles are almost always under 20% ABV, the ABV keeps dropping. I lived in Korea at that time, it was, and this is 2000 to 2002, it was usually bottled 22%, and now it's 16.9 is what you see, 16.9 to 17.5. Anyways, uh, again, shochu, Japanese shochu, the, the premium stuff is single distilled, no additives. The only thing you can add after distillation is water and time. That's it. Versus vodka, same thing. Similar to the Korean soju, although as you know, vodka usually has a higher proof at, at bottling. Rum, this is interesting. And this is something that Stephen and I have been geeking out about we just all over the place recently. Um, we have a, a new podcast that we have been working on. It just dropped la uh, this week. Oh, just started this week. We've got a few episodes up. And last night we recorded an episode about Japanese rum. And of course, there is a major style of shochu that's made from kokuto, which is this super dark, mostly unrefined cake sugar. And it's, we're talking slabs of this stuff that is used to make a rice-based spirit down in the Amami Islands. And it's a style that's protected by the Japanese government. It's kind of like a regional, it's like a national GI, basically. It can only be made in the Amami Islands. And rum, rum is, there's some similarities. You'll, you'll notice it if you ever get your hands on some kokuto shochu, but, Kokuto shochu must be made with rice koji. That's a rule by the Japanese tax strictures. And if it's not made with rice koji, or if it's not made in amami, then it can't be kokuto shochu. It's, it's a part of the law. So there's, there's a pretty significant difference there. And there are other differences too, which we can get into later vis-a-vis -vis the amount of aging that is permitted, the cask aging that is, that is allowed. In the shochu world, Cask aging is very limited, again, due to labeling laws and taxation laws. Finally, whiskey. Um, for shochu, you're not allowed to use malted barley. So there's no malt. Um, a lot of times when koji, rice koji is translated into English, it's translated as malt, malted rice, but you can't malt a polished grain because the germ has been removed. It can't grow. So it's that's a that's technically and biologically incorrect, but uh, it's pearled barley that's used in the shochu world, uh, polished barley, and you're not allowed to use any malt whatsoever. Also, again, the aging is limited. So you 
tend not to get very dark cask aged shochu. It tends to be very light, almost like a straw color. You never get any, any deep ambers or anything like that. Okay, then let's, let's move on to the next drink. And Stephen can help me out with which number it is on the list. We're gonna go north a little bit here to Iki Island for our Iki shochu. And this is a barley shochu. This is a very old tradition. And one of the rules with Iki shochu is that it's a two to one, we'll say one to two ratio of rice to barley, primary to main fermentation. All right, so in the primary fermentation, you have koji rice. And then in the secondary fer fermentation, you have barley added to it. At a, a two parts barley to one part rice koji. And that's, it has to be made in that way. And it can only be made on Iki Island, that tiny little island up there. There are seven distilleries making this style. We have a very nice, a very expressive barley shochu for you. Which number is it, Stephen? This is sample number three. Sample number three. Okay. That's right. And it's called Yamanomori, made by the distillery of the same name. Seven distilleries on the island, as I said, making this style. And this is atmospheric distilled. So a much higher temperature distillation. And anything that's atmospheric distilled is just going to have a lot deeper, nuttier flavors, especially if it's a grain. Um, you're going to get uh, just, it's, it's going to have more attitude. It's going to have a more complex aroma profile. And this one can be consumed oyuari, as you see down in the serving notes, oyuari is with hot water. And this is my preferred way to enjoy shochu. I will almost always start from oyuari to see if it works. And it works most of the time. Um, I will take, I have a lot of, uh, you know, ceramics and, and pottery and you know, there are no rules. You can drink it in anything that won't crack with hot water poured into it. And you, I pour the hot water in there. You can see I have my tea fall kettle right up here. Can, I'm pointing to it. Um, it's a very, very important working member of this, what looks like a closet, but is actually my home office. And pour that into the cup. This is room temperature. Usually takes about six minutes for, for the hot water to cool enough to get down to where I love it. I'm sorry, I'm almost entirely on Celsius now. 60 degrees Celsius is kind of 60 to 65 degrees Celsius is the sweet spot for me. That's when I pour the room temperature shochu in on top very slowly. Don't need to mix it. Convection will allow it to mix itself. And then when you, when you get those aromas with the hot water, it's absolutely magic. And this works very well, this particular shochu, as, as does the next one. Uh, for the barley shochus of Japan. Actually, the biggest tradition in terms of the, in terms of volume, I'm going to go back a slide. You can see up there on the upper right of this map is Oita barley shochu. You've probably seen or heard of Ichiko. Ichiko is the biggest, the most popular, the best-selling barley shochu in Japan. And it's widely, or it's, it's not widely, but it is, it is available in the United States. I know that it's available near where you live and work, and you can go and check that style out. That's actually a 100% barley shochu that is made in Oita, and Oita is famous for that style. This one, however, is a, an actual w, WTO granted GI, Iki shochu, where you have to use rice koji in the primary fermentation. And if you try these side by side with the rice, the barley, you'll notice, ah, single pot distillation really does allow these aromas to come through. There's a clear distinction between them and it's only gonna get more different as we move on. And just this is, I'm gonna put this in your brain now because I've been talking about it and Steven's gonna fill in so many of the details, but here's, an, here's, some, here's how the workflow goes in the distillery, generally speaking. The bottle on the right side, on top, the brown bottle is a shochu bottle. 
And the blue labeled bottle is an Awamori bottle. And they follow the same flow, but you'll notice that the blue arrow at the bottom of the screen skips the main Moromi. What that means is it's a 100% rice koji fermentation. The, the ingredients are, it's, it's only koji rice. That's it. So this is an old school way of doing it. Like I said, awamori is a little bit older than shochu. And I think a lot of shochu actually was made in a similar style for a long time. But modern shochu practices say that, well, a really good way to make a delicious spirit is to have a main fermentation after you've gotten the starter going. The primary fermentation is giving the yeast a head start, allowing it to grow and multiply. And then in the main fermentation, where you divvy up the primary fermentation and add the main ingredient, that's where the sweet potatoes are added, or that's where the kokuto sugar is added. Or as you can see from this image, you might have buckwheat or barley or more rice. And so if it's a rice sh shochu, it's gonna be rice plus rice equals rice. If it's a sweet potato shochu, it's gonna be rice plus sweet potato equals sweet potato shochu. All right, and then everything goes into a, sink, a pot still, one distillation, and voila, you have fun in a bottle. Okay, let's. I'm going to hand over to Stephen, and just to remind you about Satsuma Shochu, this is the most prolific of the prefectures in terms of, I suppose, the variety of brand, the number of brands that are produced. There are Close, there are 108, by last count, active distilleries in this prefecture. And Stephen can fill you in on how remarkable that is as a number unto itself. And this is a style that, that says that you, you have to use locally harvested sweet potatoes. The koji and everything else has to be made in the prefecture. And it's a, it's a very, very, it's, well, Stephen and I drink it all the time. A lot of what I have behind me is Satsuma Shochu. It's not something that a lot of people are, are used to in the United States in terms of the flavor profile. It is so deep. It is so different. It is lovely. And I'm going to, without further ado, let's get a deep dive on, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to introduce this. I forgot I'm going to introduce this so you can drink it while Steven's talking about how it's made. This is our, what number is this, Steven? Sato this is Kuro. number one. Oh, we're at number one. Okay. So Sato Kuro, you guys are so lucky that you have this in, in, uh, in the United States. It is really hard to find this in Tokyo. This is a very well-respected sweet potato shochu and I can't get it, but you can. It's not fair. Um, so Kirishima is a city kind of, if you know how Kagoshima is shaped, it's like two legs. It's right up at the right up where the two legs meet. Rice koji, bl uh, black koji this time. This is the first time we're meeting a black koji. Sweet potatoes in the second, in the main fermentation. And these are kogane sengan, which is the most common strain or species or varietal of sweet potato in the shochu industry. 25% again, same as everything. This one works really well with hot water. Really, really, really well with hot water. Um, and also really nice is my, my wadi in my experience, my wadi, that last word down there at the bottom means you take basically a half a bottle of the shochu, add some, I guess I would, I would use filtered water and let it sit for a couple of days in a cool place. And then you've got something that's very nice to heat up. You don't add any water when you heat it up, but you heat it up lightly and it's absolutely divine. And Stephen is going to talk about his experience and, and the place that he calls home down in, in Kagoshima when he goes there. So I'm going to relinquish the screen and let him kidnap it. There you go. All right. Thank you very much, Christopher, for that. Uh... Excellent overview. I think uh, if anybody has questions for Christopher, feel free to drop them in the chat uh, and he can answer them as we're going through the video. And the this video is uh, about 20 minutes long. So 
Christopher and I are going to have a little bit of a dialogue. It won't just be me talking. Uh, and then if you have any questions about what you're seeing on video, please drop in the chat and Christopher can ask me as we're going through. So now I will share my screen. Here we go. And can everybody see that, hopefully? So this is Yamato Zakoda Distillery. Uh, I've removed the audio because it's quite noisy in the distillery. But uh, this is uh, the smallest handmade shochu distillery in Kagoshima Prefecture. Yamato Zakoda has been making shochu since the 1800s, probably 1850s. This is the interior of the distillery. You see these ceramic pots buried in the floor. We'll talk a little bit more about that. In making shochu, the first step is to wash the rice. This happens between 5.30 and 6 a.m. Uh, 100 times a year. He makes 100 batches a year. Uh, and the first step is to make the koji. Now the rice after it's been polished is covered with residue. It's got residual dust. So there might be a little bit of bran, there might be some proteins. You wanna get all of that removed from the rice. And he does this, uh, this process he's doing now, he does 30 strokes on the left side, 30 strokes on the right side, repeats that uh, four times over the course of five minutes, rinses the rice, dr drains the water. You see how white and cloudy, it's already almost becoming milky. He, he rinses and repeats. He does this uh, four times uh, over the course of about 30 minutes uh, to wash the rice. And then if you're familiar with sake production, you then need to uh, moisturize the rice. And so he fills the tank with water once he's finished with the washing process and leaves it for approximately one hour. It really depends on what kind of rice he's using. That will vary. The next stage after that is to steam the rice. So here he's got his nice washed rice and he moves it actually by bucket like this into the steamer, which is a very old style steamer, uh, probably older than he is. Um, and what he'll do is he'll steam half of it, mix that to, to loosen it up. And it's not a full steam, it's just to, to moisturize again, to get it uh, up to temperature. And then he uh, steams it again, or sorry, he fills in the second half of the batch and partially steams that and then he mixes that again and here he is doing that mixing process this is to assure that he gets a nice even steam throughout the 150 kilograms of rice i think we figured out how many pounds that is it's a lot right uh, i don't remember the the uh the imperial 2.2 of some 2.2 <laughs> per kilogram is per that right kilo. so a little yep. guess about 350 little. pounds or so uh, and that's when it's dry. So it's gotten much heavier by this time. And uh, it'll go through a full steam in the steamer, which will take about uh, 40 minutes. And this is uh, all local uh, rice from Kagoshima Prefecture. Uh, Kagoshima is not known for its rice. In fact, part of the reason they started making sweet potatoes is because it's very uh, ashy, rocky soil and grains tend not to grow very well there. Uh, and so sweet potatoes were a common uh, agricultural product because sweet potatoes grow anywhere. Uh, here's the steaming as it goes. You can see how old this still is, as long as this wash tub is, is pretty old too. This is all equipment. That, this is, distillery is actually relatively new. The building itself, they, they relocated about 15 years ago, maybe close to 20 years ago now, but all of that is old equipment from the previous distillery. Now the kochi itself, <clears throat> once the rice is steamed, you need to cool that rice. Uh, koji is a mold. It's a living organism. It's actually the national mold of Japan. Japan takes its mold so seriously that, that they have a national mold. Uh, and koji is the one chosen because koji is, a, is the base of traditional fermentation in Japan. Uh, soy sauce, miso, mirin, all of those things are made using koji. So here's that steamed rice. It's very hot at this point. It's just a little bit under uh, 212 degrees. Uh, it then needs to be cooled down before you can propagate it with koji. Otherwise, you'll kill the koji because it'll be too hot for it to survive. Uh, and this cooling process, this is happening about two or three in the afternoon. And this is really the hardest part of the workday. Uh, it's hot, it's heavy. And, uh, and also, you see how the table is really low. Uh, because this is a rural distillery, small distillery in the countryside, the, the uh, distillery st assisting staff tends to be older women. Uh, usually retirees, and they don't work well at a table that would be a comfortable height for for uh, Tekan, the the Toji, and so he's made this low table so everybody kneels beside the table and and does this mixing, and I can tell you that's really hard on your knees and back if you're not used to it. 
Um, but the the uh, it, he's he's the only full time uh, person at the distillery. He has one gentleman that comes in and works a full day during the season, and then he has two little old ladies that come in the morning and two little old ladies that come in the afternoon uh, to help with production. And then there is uh, a couple of women who come in and work in the bottling and labeling facility, usually in the afternoon. Uh, and that's the entire team. So it's six part-time workers, uh, one seasonal full-time, and then tech on. And then I come in and help over a few weeks a year uh, when he needs it. Uh, usually I try to hit, hit the distillery when he's at peak production because he, he gets pretty tired. This takes about, it's about a 15 hour day every day for uh, over three months. Uh, so here we're just moving the rice around to cool it down and uh, getting this ready to propagate the, the koji uh, spores. So if there's any questions, now might be a good time. Uh, he uses only white koji. Uh, Christopher talked about the three different styles. And uh, the, the names are not the official names, those, but they're called white, black, and yellow based on what they look, what the grains look like once the koji blooms on the surface of the rice. And you'll see once we get to that point, it's a bright white bloom of koji on, on the rice, uh, where if you, and if, if you see a white koji first fermentation, which you'll see, it's, it's, it's basically an eggshell color. It's almost the color of the rice you see here a black koji fermentation will be dark gray once you get the koji into the uh, fermentation pot, uh, which, which we'll see a little Steven, bit. Yep. What is, what does koji taste like? If you, if you, if you eat the grains that have koji propagated onto them, what, yeah, what's that's like? a, that's a, that's an excellent question. So the koji uh, is it's sacrificing the rice. It's breaking the starches into sugars. That's its main job so that the yeast can convert the sugars to alcohol. And so the koji is a little bit sweet. The kojified rice is a little bit sweet. Although the reason Christopher mentioned earlier that most sake is made using yellow koji and uh, most shochu is made with using white koji and awamori is always made with black koji. The reason white and black koji are predominant in Southern Japan is because it's hot and humid. Yellow koji does not create natural uh, acids. You have, to, you have to add some sort of acid to the base uh, for yellow for sake production um here this is actually the koji it comes uh there are, i think four different koji makers in japan most virtually every distillery buys their koji making koji is a full-time job in its in its own right so here he is using basically like a almost a salt shaker or a, a flour sifter because the koji has uh it's it's propagated uh white koji on rice and you see it's coming out a little bit dark. I'm not sure how clearly you can see that in this video quality, but um, it's turning almost a light brown once it's gone fully to spore. You'll see how white it is in a, in a subsequent video of it. Um, now, the rice grains are staying in that shift, sifter that he's holding and the, and the koji spores itself. You can see them floating through the air. That's all koji. All that dust is koji mold. And that's the reason he's wearing a respirator as he does this process. Because uh, koji allergy is a thing among distillery and brewery workers. Uh, so once you've propagated, then you've got to mix it all by hand. The goal, and I'm not kidding, is to get 12 to 13 koji spores per grain of rice. Um, that's a very specific goal, but that's what they shoot for. We don't know how you calculate that, but uh, we do this process. And what we're doing now is we're both trying to get koji on every grain. And we're also, because koji gets all over our hands while we're doing this. And the other thing we're doing is we're getting it down to a lower temperature. We're cooling the rice through this process uh, because the koji is happiest at about 30 to 36, 38 degrees centigrade, uh, which again, I'm gonna let Christopher work the math out on that as far as Fahrenheit. Um, but the, because once you've got it in this big pile, koji wants a hot, humid environment but it doesn't want to be too hot. It's pretty temperamental. As Tekkan says, koji is honest. So if you want to have a really strong koji uh, uh, base for your, for your distillate or for your alcohol, you need to make sure that the koji is very happy and it's happiest in a hot human environment. So this is the koji room. Uh, it's a cedar walled room. It actually has rice bran between the walls and the stone, between the wood and the stone to help insulate. And then it, it has, uh, the, you can keep the room heated. 
So we put that koji to bed for the night. The next morning, it's this big block of dried rice. Uh, and this is the full-time seasonal gentleman who will now break up this rice using uh, this mixer. This is one of the few concessions in this handmade distillery of using electric technology to do anything. Almost everything's done with steam and human uh, activity. And uh, so here he's breaking that up. What he's doing is he's aerating it. Koji is aerobic. It wants to uh, be, you know, be exposed to oxygen. And he's also cooling it down because as the koji is converting starches to sugars, it's also generating heat. So when we put this to sleep the night before, it was about 30, 34 degrees Celsius. By, by the next morning, it's about 42 degrees Celsius. And that's, that heat is generated purely by the koji uh, process. So it's broken up here. It's put back to sleep uh, for another few hours um, to let it continue to, um, to do the sacrification process. This entire koji making process takes a little bit, just under uh, 48 hours, uh, typically. And you can't really see any bloom on this rice yet because it's only been about 12 hours, no, probably about 18 hours at this point. It's not quite to halfway. Uh, the next step uh, here, that big mound of rice, we've broken it up again because it's again gotten solid. And we're putting it into these individual trays, which allows you to more evenly maintain temperature. And you see he makes a little uh, volcano divot in the, you know, it's almost the caldera vol volcano. That's to allow maximum oxygen exposure because again, the koji wants to breathe and it's going to be happiest when it's getting oxygen. Uh, and then again, you want to keep it cool. So what what we do is we hand mix. We do this twice during the late afternoon, early evening, and then again in the late evening. And this is why it becomes such a long day. Remember, he started at 6 a.m. He'll usually finish this process about 11 p.m., sometimes as late as after midnight, because again, Koji is honest. Koji wants to be maintained at the, and, and mixed at the right time, at the right temperature. And now he's making these grooves. He's making it look like a plowed field because again, he's trying to maximize exposure and this is actually because there's less uh, koji internal, uh, there's more oxygen exposure toward the end. And then the final stage is actually what's called day koji. This is where you remove the koji from the koji room. And now you're putting it into the, um, moving it into the first fermentation. And I don't know if you saw from that video, but the koji had a white bloom on it at that point. Now we're gonna move all that kojified rice into the first fermentation, which is done in these ceramic pots. These pots are all over 100 years old. These were handmade, uh, probably in the mid 1800s, if not earlier. And this making these pots by hand no longer happens in Japan. There's nobody that knows how to make these large, these are about uh, 600 liter pots. And so if they break, uh, there are ways to repair them, fortunately. But um, the reason that they're buried in the ground like that is for two reasons. One is you want to maintain temperature and two, um, uh, to, to allow this mixing process. And this mixing is very important. So at this point, you've added water and yeast into the first fermentation and you're adding the koji. So all that sacrificed rice, it's now very sweet, but it's also acidic. Remember, I, met, uh, I didn't get to that point earlier, sorry. Um, the white and black koji actually create natural lactic, uh, sorry, citric acid. And so when you eat this koji rice, it's actually sweet and sour. Mm -hmm. uh, so to finally answer Christopher's question. <laughs> um, the, and, and so this is water and yeast in the uh, first fermentation along with the koji rice. And that's all that's in here. But yeast is anaerobic. So it doesn't want to be oxygenated, but you mix the pot so that the koji can continue to oxygenate. And that's what he's doing here. And you want to agitate the yeast. When you agitate the yeast, you create aromas that are desirable in the final product because yeast makes aromas when it's not happy. And so that's the, the dual purpose here. Well, there's actually three. One is to aerate the koji, two is to agitate the yeast, and three is again to maintain temperature. Uh, and these fermentations are typically tried, he tries to keep these, temp these fermentations between about 25 and 30 degrees centigrade. Uh, in these pots. And these are, op it's open pot fermentation. So house yeast are getting in. Uh, anything that wants to join the party is welcome to, but that acidity that's created by the koji prevents other organisms from, from corrupting the fermentation. He's been the master brewer distiller here for 15 years, and he's had exactly one fermentation go off in all of that time. 
So that's what about 1500 fermentation attempts and he's, he's lost one batch uh, due to corruption by another organism. And you can see the yeast is really happy in this pot. This is not the first day. This is probably day two or day three. This goes on for about six days, the first fermentation. And this is, would be the shubo in sake production. It's, mm -hmm. it's basically that yeast starter. Uh, and then this is a sweet potato shochu. So he uses uh, 750 kilograms of sweet potatoes to his 150 kilograms of rice. So a f what's that five to one uh, ratio? And these are Kogane Sengan. Um, obviously sweet potatoes are root vegetables, essentially tubers, and they grow in the ground, right? So they're very dirty and you wanna leave the dirt on the potatoes uh, after harvest because uh, it helps preserve them. All those, the, the microbiome or the biome in the soil is, is helping protect the potatoes until you're ready to process them. But you wanna wash them first because you don't want dirt in your fermentation, right? So they're gonna be washed and steamed. And this is the washing process. This happens about 8 a.m. We've just had breakfast and a couple of cups of coffee and we're raring to go. Um, and the Kogane Sengan are actually potatoes. They're, they're very large, uh, generally, much larger than what we would get in a supermarket. And these are basically cultivated specifically for shochu production. These are not food potatoes. Uh, they are sweet potatoes. They are a little bit sweet, but they're not as sweet as what we're used to. And they have very high starch content, which is desirable for alcohol yield. And also a lot, you, you get very high yields per acre. And for Christopher and I, this is actually our favorite style of sweet potato shochu because of the aromas that it imparts. It's really unique and really interesting. That's what Sato Kuro is. Uh, and so the, we separate all of the potatoes into these baskets and then Tekkan uh, washes them through this machine. And then he, you see, he smells the potato there. He can actually, he can detect rot by how the potato smells. Um, so if he's worried that the potato is rotting at all, he wants to discard that because you don't want that rotten potato in your fermentation. Uh, once he's washed them, they become this off white color. And then it's our job to trim these potatoes. You cut off the ends because they're bitter and then you look for any other rotting spots and cut them away. Uh, and actually this past season, one of the little old ladies retired. Uh, and so an older gentleman actually joined uh, this year. It's the first time I've ever worked with with a, um, a man doing this sweet potato cutting process. See, I'm digging, uh, he digging has, out a rot, he, rotten spot. There yep. you go. He, he's the, the guy with the good shoe game, right? That's right. I remember I remember him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tekkan off, on his Instagram often comments on his footwear. It's funny. <laughs> yeah. So uh, once, once all those potatoes are processed, they're put into this uh, industrial steamer. Uh, and this is what they look like when they come out. I've actually never seen this. I'm always busy in another part of the distillery uh, when the steaming is finished. Uh, but there you have all your steamed sweet potatoes, uh, which will then be ground up uh, basically almost like in a potato mincer and go into the second fermentation along with the first fermentation and more water. How long does it take to steam that huge batch of sweet potatoes? It's a couple of hours in the steamer yeah. to get through the entire, the entire thing. Wow. Yeah, and then the second fermentation turns a, a more yellowish and it becomes quite creamy. Uh, and this fermentation goes for about um, eight, nine days at Yamato Zakoda. It varies by distillery. And what Tekkan's taught me is he, he decides when it's ready to go based on the aroma of the fermentation. He waits until it gets to peak aroma, like what Heath considers the best smell. And then he waits two more days. Uh, because what's going to happen is the yeast will start to die off and you don't want a lot of dead yeast, but he wants a little bit of dead yeast. So that's why he waits till past peak. And then the final step is you move the fermentation into uh, the still. This still is actually older than his father. It's is a stainless this, steel still. This it's, still is older than baseball. <laughs> uh, and this, this still actually, um, it's quite finicky. And it's one of the smaller stills you'll see in a shochu distillery. It's a, as Christopher says, one-time distillation and there's something else I was going to say about it, but a Christopher's baseball comment got me thinking about the Red Sox season. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. But uh, so anyway, one time through the still. And then the, the interesting thing for those of you who understand spirits in Shochu in Awamori, they don't really throw away the heads. They, they'll, they'll keep the heads. And that's actually not usual at all in spirits tradition. So here's the, the clear distillate coming out uh, in, and it's a, it's again, 
uh, put into one of these ceramic pots in the floor. It's only left here for uh, one day and then it's moved into a, an, an enamel tank. He does do some pot aging for his shochu, but it's uh, not very common because he just doesn't have enough pots available. And also if, one, if there's an earthquake and the pot breaks with aging distillate in it, you've lost that batch. It's just gonna seep into the ground. So, um, but that's the- about the tails, Stephen? Yeah, the tails are, the re so sweet potato shochu is a, usually uh, the, the raw distill is about 37% alcohol on average. Uh, and that's actually because the desirable flavors are in the tails. And in barley and rice shochu, that tends to be between 42 to 45% for the raw distillate. Uh, most of his tank aging is done in these, or most of his aging is done in these, these large enamel lined stainless tanks. Most of his tanks are outside. Um, for this particular distillery. Some, some distilleries do all of their aging in, inside. Uh, he's got this very rustic bottling machine. This is one of our old ladies. She may not look old, but she's uh, I think old enough to be my grandmother. Um, I call her the fast grandmother because she runs everywhere in the distillery. Oh uh, yeah, um, I remember her. Yeah, and these are 1.8 liter bottles that are being filled here. This is actually, this is his premium pot aged uh, shochu, which unfortunately is, there's only 3,000 of these bottles a year produced. So um, hopefully they'll come, come to the States one day, but maybe not anytime soon. Uh, so this has actually been filtered and diluted. Uh, it's a rough filtration. It's not carbon act activated carbon or anything like that. Uh, and then it's diluted to 25% alcohol for his mainline products. And he does do some 35% bottlings as well uh, in limited production. This is, but this is a uh, 25%. This is very, very lightly filtered. If you keep one of these bottles in a cold room, you're going to have like jellyfish, legless jellyfish floating in the glass from all of the residual uh, fatty acids um, that exist. So the main brand is there on the right. That's uh, in the brown bottle. But then he's got this special brand with this, uh, di this die cut label, which is pretty hard to put on, I think, judging by how much work it takes here. But that's the uh, the process. A lot of these uh, distilleries, again, there's over a hundred in Kagoshima Prefecture. Uh, to give you perspective, Kyushu Island has a land mass of Maryland, the state of Maryland, and Kagoshima is just one small part of that island. So it's kind of like the eastern shore, having 108 shochu distilleries, 108 distilleries just on the eastern shore. Um, mm. Pretty pretty remarkable the, the density. And shochu is just part of the culture in, in Kagoshima. It's, it's often referred to as the shochu kingdom uh, because shochu is simply everywhere. There are seven distilleries in this town. Uh, and this town, it's in a municipality of 28,000 people, but all seven distilleries are uh, on the east side, on the east side of the river that splits the town. And this side has, I think, 11,000 people with seven mm -hmm. distilleries. Uh, and again, Yamato Zakura is the smallest. So there you have the finished product. So that's a beauty. That's, that's a beauty. Potato shochu production. That um, there's a question about, and I was typing an answer to it, but maybe you can answer it um, more efficiently. How about in terms of the the conditioning tanks, the aging tanks? Is there the question is, do they vary for, by distillery from distillery to distillery, or is there one preferable size? In, I would say in small to medium sized distilleries, they're almost always using a 10,000 liter tank. Although in uh, larger distilleries, in fact, across the street from Imata Zakura is one of the largest distilleries in, in Kagoshima. And yeah. they age in, I think their tanks are 40 or 50,000 liter tanks. So there's, they're several stories tall. Uh, but typically, ten, these 10,000 liter tanks are pretty ubiquitous for the smaller producers. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And a question about the, the room where the koji is, is grown, that humidity controlled room. It, the question is, um, by, using ex, by using exposed wood surfaces in the fermentation room or the koji making room, I guess the fermentation room as well, because that, that whole area is wood as, as well. Um, will it help to stabilize the spore environment? What, that's do, actually, what effect that's does correct. that have? Yeah, the, seed, the cedar is antibacterial. Uh, that's why we have cedar closets and that sort of thing. So um, it, it tends to, to keep unwanted organisms away. Very, very cool. 
So um, when you drink Yamato Zakura sweet potato shochu, how do you prefer to enjoy it, Stephen? Yeah, so my favorite way of drinking Yamato Zakura is it's called Choi Mizu. So it wasn't on Christopher's list of different styles, but Choi it means little, a little bit. So uh, and so Mizu Wadi is uh, mixed with cold water. It's usually ice and cold water and shochu about 50-50 ratio. Choi Mizu is a splash of water on the on the rocks. So I tend to drink Yamato Zakura maybe nine parts shochu, one part water, just to get a little bit of the dilution started uh, over ice. That's how I prefer it for, I tend to drink uh, any white koji sweet potato shochu that way. Black koji, I'm more prone to going toward oyuwadi as Christopher drinks everything. I think he even drinks his, <laughs> his milk mixed with, with hot water. Um, but yeah, the other, the other really, if you really want to go deep geek, you take your Yamano Mori or your Sato Kuro and you heat it up not again, not above uh, the boiling point of alcohol, but you heat up the, the like you would make atsukan sake, like your heat, your heated sake, your warm sake, and then you pour that over a big ball of ice, and that's called oh, yeah. uh, kanrok, which is uh, just all of those aromas that you get from the oyawadi hit you, but then you still get it, and then there's just a, it's a really fascinating way of drinking. Cool shit. drink, yeah. It's a lot of work, though. It is a bit of work, isn't it? <laughs> and you got yeah. you got to make those perfect ice balls too ideally that's right um fantastic that was a that was a awesome and very very in-depth look at i mean more in-depth than you'll ever get look at how shochu is made and this is a handmade shochu distillery uh the place where the koji is propagated and and developed that's a that is not temperature regulate the only way you're allowed to regulate temperature in there correct me if i'm wrong Stephen, is through opening vents in the ceiling right there are two vents in the ceiling, and there is, there are there are uh, steam pipes running along okay. the floorboards that can okay. add heat and, um, but that's really how it's how it's maintained. But there's no air and conditioner they, in there or anything, right? No, there isn't. You just have the the steam pipes in the in the floorboards, and then there's two these two wooden vents that you can open or close depending on how much uh, humidity you, you want to let escape. And it's it seems like, and I know that there's only three. In Kagoshima Prefecture, there's only three distilleries out of 110 who have continued to make all of their sweet potato shochu by hand. Is handmade sweet potato shochu objectively better than more modern practices? Why, why does Tekkan continue to bust his back and mm. destroy his health <laughs> making this very old school style of shochu? Yeah, well, uh, he really wants to maintain the family traditions it's, it's very much about that. I don't necessarily think it's objectively better. I think that the care that you, because, well, so there's actually, there, there are modern uh, machine made, uh, they're koji machines that help right. you do this. And the nice thing about that is you get a consistent, you know, you set the right uh, conditions in the, in the computer that, that runs the machine and you're gonna get the same quality of koji every time. So you get consistency, right? And, and you can probably do it if, if you set, that machine correctly, you're going to get a better propagation than humans will on a batch by batch basis, right? So I think right. that machine made shochu can be just as good. Um, I think the thing is once you get to using machines, you're looking at higher volumes, larger production, and you're losing the touch, the, the, the hand, like every single potato is checked for rot. In larger distilleries, they just don't have that, that capacity. Mm -hmm. There's 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 no way that you can get every single potato inspected before it goes into the fermentation. So I do think from that perspective, you know, and if you've got um, you've got rotten potatoes, you're going to end up with a not so tasty ferment at the end. Gotcha. It's just not. There, there's a couple of times that I've been trying something out when I'm out with Tech on on his rare night off, yeah. and I'll say, "What's that aroma?" He's like, "Oh, that's that's rot. They they uh, didn't they didn't get man, all of the." It's it's an absolute it's a it's a good workout, isn't it? Is it? Would you say that this is a good diet plan? Go work in a shochu distillery. Oh yeah, no, th this is my gym. I, I uh, when I was living in New York anyway, I didn't really have a lot of time to to get extra exercise, and so I'd go to the distillery and lose ten pounds every year. Okay. Uh, now that I live in Japan, <laughs> I can get more exercise. But... <laughs> sure. Um, and for those of you who aren't aware, Stephen is actually a research doctor at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. Um, he's got a background in epidemiology and sports injuries. Um, so he, he is able to, he very 
clearly analyze the effects that these this uh, experience has on the human body. Um, so thank you very much for that, Stephen. I'm going to jump back in. Thank We're going to give everyone another drink to to try. Um, now, let me see. Oh, yeah, it's the whole sharing transition thing. This is something that really needs to be uh, figured out, I suppose. Um, okay, so share the screen and there you are and hit that button. Okay, and we're back, I think. Do it. Okay, so we've gone through the top three on the left and um, we, uh, Jay had actually mentioned this at the top of the show. We've, we're, we're gonna go south into the Amami Islands um, theoretically and talk about Kokuto Shochu. However, there was a little bit of a, we, we, had, we sent you something that's a little bit sweeter than this. So I'm gonna say that we skip, which, which sample is it? What number is the sample it's, for the sample for the, four and uh, sample four? Sample four. Yeah, and I just posted okay. it on the chat box. I'm so sorry about that. It, 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 it. It's yeah. to totally, totally fine. Um, and this is going to be what you have is an umeshu, which is going to be really nice for maybe the end of the tasting. Almost, you'll be able to. It's almost like more of a dessert. Uh, but I think what I can do really quickly is just talk about kokuto very quickly. And and then Stephen, should should we Stephen? You think we save the the umeshu for the end? Yeah, let's let's save it for the end. Okay, so then then I'll move to our last sample, and then Stephen will come back to the the umeshu. All right. So kokuto shochu. This can only be made in the Amami Islands. It's it must be made with rice koji and then this kokuto sugar. So it has a sweetness to it that is reminiscent of rum, but it's it's deeper. It's often a bit more complex thanks to the rice koji. And it's a very, it's a subtropical environment. It's a string of islands. These distilleries are invariably not too far from the water, from the ocean. And it's a very, very interesting category that, that spans a flavor spectrum going from um, caramel and molasses all the way to, you know, grassy, minerally, um, earthy flavors and aromas, and then all the fruits, flowers, and, and uh, flora in between. A very, very cool style. And Jogo, which is available in the US market, you'll, you'll find that this is a lightly sweet, little bit floral kokuto shochu expression that is vacuum distilled. And so you can expect that it's a it's a not overly forward with its attack. Really nice with cool water. Really nice on the rocks. Good in a in a pseudo highball. However you want to stand that up. And um, it's a it's a category that in the United States at this moment is mostly on the vacuum distilled side. What Stephen and I are really excited to see happen in the near future is for atmospheric distilled kokuto shochu to hit the US market as well, because it's really deep and really rich and beautiful. Um, so we're gonna come back to that sample that is kokuto umeshu, and that is a liqueur that uses kokuto, but it also uses ume, so it's more of a dessert, very sweet type of thing, lower, lower proof. And instead, I'm going to go all the way south here to the to Okinawa, and we're going to try. Um, this is this is one that I have a bottle of myself, uh, Shima Uta. All right. As I said before, Awamori and Ryukyu Awamori in partic particular must use black koji, and it is actually an all koji fermentation. So there's no main moi to speak of, it's just 100% koji rice. And by tax law, it's black koji. You cannot use white koji. You cannot use yellow koji. You definitely wouldn't want to use yellow koji all the way down south in Okinawa because you're gonna get a lot of spoiled batches as Stephen mentioned. Um, and one of the reasons why sake is mostly made in the winter is Obviously, it's after har rice harvesting season, but also because those cold temperatures help to protect the fermentation from any ne'er-do-wells that are floating in the environment 
and want to get in and devour all of that glucose that has been provided by the cogification process. Uh, black koji creates a lot of nat natural acidity in the fermentation. And so you can have open fermentations in a subtropical environment and really not have to worry about it too much. Um, this one is 25% alcohol, shima uta. It is made with uh, rice from Thailand and it is again, single pot distilled. If you stack it up side by side with the first sample we tried, you'll notice some distinct differences. Um, now, while this is, as far as awamori goes, not the most forward, not the most aggressive awamori you'll find, it is definitely earthier and you can really notice the koji. The, the truth, to be honest with you though, 25% is a little bit on the low end in terms of ABV for awamori. Awamori is usually bottled at 30. And I'm gonna pour a little bit for myself just so that I can have a whiff. And it's, this is a, this is a really nice light unassuming awamori. This, I think you could, you could sip this all day. Traditionally, tra not traditionally, typically down in Okinawa, it's consumed mizuari. So rocks and then some cool water on top. And you can just drink it for days. It's a great afternoon sipper. Um, and, you know, if you get something that's aged and in, in Okinawa, they do a lot of clay pot aging. And this is a fascinating part of the awamori world. They, then you get these, these drinks that have been aged for three, five, 10 years in clay and they take on, they get, they mellow out, but then they go in really interesting directions. You get like a lot of maple syrup and caramel notes. You get a lot of just really deep accents to these drinks. And another interesting thing about aging in the awamori in Okinawan tradition is they kind of have, using clay pots, not barrels, they kind of have a solera aging system, just like in sherry, and where you have, you know, vintage to vintage being blended back. Now, the way that they do this is they'll have a, a giant pot or a set of pots that are from, you know, 10 years ago. And then that's the oldest one. That's the oldest family of the solera, so to speak. It's called a shitsugi in Japanese. And when you're gonna, when you wanna drink at home, you pour from the oldest pot into your kara for whatever container you're gonna use to pour for your guests. And then you pour from year nine into year 10. And then from eight years ago, refills nine years ago until you get all the way to the front of the solera and you're filling that with this year's batch, refilling. And so what ends up happening because some of these soleras are so old is that you've probably still got distilled in there from like decades and decades ago. So there's this amazing carryover of tradition and culture that's, you know, you're, you're probably, you're probably tasting a little bit of the, the awamori that your great grandmother, you know, was enjoying that, that type of thing. It's a very, very cool aspect of awamori culture. Unfortunately in the U S there's not a whole lot to speak of yet that will hopefully change very soon. Um, so we're going to now move back to dessert and that's the, I think it was sample number four. Is that right? Yep. No. It, I, am I right? That's right. And, yes. and this is, and this is something that Steven writes about in his book. He writes a bit about umeshu. So I'm going to hand it over to him so that he can tell you about this kokuto umeshu. Yep. So it seems we got it half right. We got a kokuto base umeshu. And so uh, typically umeshu is made with what's called korui shochu or uh, multiply distilled shochu. A little bit confusingly, it's still called shochu, even though it doesn't follow any of the rules of honkaku shochu, because shochu in Japanese simply means burned alcohol or burned liquor because of distillation. This is a very old term. And it's the same uh, origin of the word soju in Korean. They sound very similar and they have the same meaning, which is essentially distilled alcohol. Uh, and so anything that's made in a still could, could be called shochu in Japanese. And so back when the patent still or the multiple distillation was machine was introduced to Japan. 
Uh, they just started calling it shochu as well, and that creates confusion. But most ume shu is made with that, basically a very light vodka. So usually ume, uh, sorry, uh, korui shochu is about 35% alcohol. Um, so most ume shu is actually made at home by, uh, by families. You, you know, people love their grandmother's ume shu or their aunt's ume shu or that sort of thing. And so it, at the ume harvest every year in the grocery stores, you'll find uh, the plums, the Japanese plums, rock sugar, and korui shochu, or what they call white liquor sometimes, on the same shelf in the grocery store. They're, they're just right. side by side because everybody yeah. goes home and makes their own ume shu. Although it's often like ume... right at the front of the supermarket when you walk in. It's like, oh, it's ume season, right? And then it's all of like a one of like... the end displays just as you walk into right. the store. Yep. And um, But there is commercial ume shu, and that's what you've got uh, in your sample. Now, this is made with a kokuto shochu base. So it's using... Uh, the ume season is in June um, for about four days, I think. It's a very, very short season. Um, but the um, kokuto shochu should give your ume shu a more interesting and richer, deeper taste than you would get from an ume shu that was made with a korui or uh, multiply distilled shochu, because that's essentially going to be like soaking the plums in vodka. Uh, uh, but with kokuto shochu, you've got much more flavor. And uh, these are... I, I was looking at the label, sorry, I'm gonna, it's it's actually made with uh, nanko ume, and nanko ume is the most famous uh, plum uh, for making ume shu in Japan from, I believe it's Wakayama Prefecture. Is that right, Christopher? Put you on the yes. spot a little bit. Yeah, I didn't read my ume shu chapter to refresh my memory <laughs> <laughs> uh, before this, since this was a little bit of an audible, but um, an ume shu is, it's, it's got sugar in it, so it's a liqueur. Um, I tend to drink it with sparkling water. I drink it as a highball if I'm going to drink umeshu. Um, and it can be a really enjoyable drink if you like something on the sweeter side. Obviously, shochu, because of no additives, is, uh, you know, it tends to be on the drier side. It's a, it's a spirit. There's no residual sugar. Uh, umeshu will get you that sugar if you've got a sweet tooth. Um, so, so I think probably happy to take questions at this point. And, um, you know, if you've got any, I guess there was a question, how does that affect flavor? I'm not sure what that is. I'm sorry. The, um, might've been the ume. Yeah. I guess different plums will have different, uh, expressions. Oh, maturation. Maturation. Oh, in ceramic versus ceramic. steel. Ah. ah, okay. Oh, that's an excellent question. So let's, we're, this isn't an ume shoe, uh, talk. So let's go back to shochu. Okay. Um, and when you age in, uh, in, a, in a stainless or enamel tank, it's inert. There's no flavor or aroma being imparted. There's relatively little angel share in those tanks because you can seal them. Uh, so it's an efficient way of storing. And basically when you age shochu, the reason you're doing that is because the heads are kept. The heads have a lot of volatiles. Uh, there's a little bit of methanol. There's some other things that you don't really want in your final product. And so aging lets a lot of that stuff blow off. It, they, those, those volatile compounds, uh, what do they, is that degenerate? I don't know what they do. They, they basically break down into other things and the spirit mellows. When you drink shochu right off the still, it's really hot and it's really funky. But if you give it a few months, it really mellows out and becomes the drink that you're enjoying. Um, and then, but if you age in ceramic, uh, ceramic's kind of the midpoint between aging in wood and aging in the enamel tanks. In ceramic, uh, you're not getting the wood flavor and the angel share is less, but these are unglazed uh, ceramic pots. So there is some oxidization that occurs and you're also getting a little bit of minerality from the clay itself. And so a long aged ceramic, a long ceramic aged shochu well, actually, it can become quite bitter from that minerality. And so uh, a number of distilleries will let it spend some time in ceramic to give it that oxidization and then move it into an enamel tank to stabilize the spirit. Um, and that's, yeah, so that's sort of the difference between the enamel, the clay, and then, of course, wood. We know what wood does from whiskey and other, other experiences. Um, great question. Is there a point where aging no longer adds character? Um, and actually with awamori, 
That's not true. With awamori, the longer it ages in those ceramic pots, the deeper and richer it becomes. And I attribute that to uh, the, the residual fatty acids and amino acids that are left over because the Thai rice, the long grain rice that's used in awamori production has different uh, biochemical properties than Japanese rice. There, there are more oils. There's more residual oils in awamori. And awamori, for some reason, the longer it ages, the better it gets. It becomes this rich, deep caramel. Um, it's just an absolutely lovely drink. I think the oldest awamori I've had is about between probably 25 and 35 years old. And it's just an incredible experience. Uh, it's really something to just be savored and, and sipped and enjoyed uh, just straight. There is no reason to dilute that ever uh, with an aged awamori like that. Um, with shochu, I really find that if it gets beyond about five years, there really isn't much added uh, to, to longer age. I have had some longer age shochu and they can be quite nice, but they seem to age at a slower pace than the awamori. The, the, the deeper, richer flavors take a long time. Yamato Zakura, uh, where I work every year, they've got what's now a 40 year old blend of rice and sweet potato shochu. Uh, that's very, very hard to get. It was only ever sold at auction. He's got a few bottles left in the distillery. Every so often he'll open one uh, for a special occasion. And that gets to that point where the awamori is, but it took 40 years. What you might get out of a 10 or, or 15 year old awamori is taking, has taken that shochu about 40 years to reach. So um, for some reason, the awamori, the aging matters more. And with shochu, it's a little bit less. And I think it's just the what, what ends up in the final distillate after after that single run through still. Now, is the carrot shochu as interesting as the sweet potato? That's a, that, this is, this is something to, I'll throw this one to you too, Stephen. Um, what all of these minor, uh, I'm, that's a horrible word to use, all of these uh, kind of niche ingredients that are used to make shochu, the approved ingredients, you know, water chestnuts, Mm -hmm. um geez you know and you you know all the rest of them but uh you know green bell peppers and that sort of thing what's what uh are they as interesting what what's your overall assessment of a lot of these more niche products well i think um just to speak to carrot in particular i think if carrot shochu was as interesting as sweet potato there'd be more of it mm -hmm. <laughs> there really isn't much carrot shochu there's a few a few brands there's there's thousands of brands of sweet potato um I don't know how much of that is about the cost of production of carrots versus sweet potatoes, but um, it's an interest. I like the carrot shochu. It's it's fun to drink. It's a nice different experience. Um, but a lot of these, uh, I don't work. I don't mind the word minor because I used to call them them uh, gift shop shochus. So yeah, they are because a lot of these were um, basically if your local agricultural product is carrots, then your local uh, gift shop is going to sell carrot shochu. If your local yeah, the agricultural train station product gift, is, gift shop. Yeah. 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 If your local agricultural product is is uh, kelp, there's going to be a kelp shochu. If it's sure. green tea, it's going to be green tea. If it's uh, milk, there's actually milk shochu, which is wild. Um, but all of those things are really adding aromas. So we, we often, Christopher and I will categorize most of those as aromatic shochu. And they can be lovely. I think I've got um, the Mizu green tea. This is available in the States. This is actually an export only uh, yeah. brand. This is fantastic Oyuwadi. It's like drinking alcoholic green tea. This is a beautiful, beautiful aroma. It's a really, really nice drink. And that- um, And I have their lemongrass. This is not an approved ingredient, but this is the lemongrass shochu is also really nice as, a, as an aromatic. Yeah, yeah. So the, those aromatic shochu can be fantastic. I really enjoy shiso shochu. Uh, which is the, it's that little green leaf that you find under your sashimi when you go to a Japanese restaurant, you can eat that. It's, it's a, sometimes referred to as like Japanese mint or Japanese basil. Mm. And shiso shochu well-made is fantastic. So the, these minor ingredients are simply minor because there's not a lot of it produced, uh, but they can still be really, really interesting expressions to explore. I wouldn't really recommend garlic shochu. <laughs> um, tried it, don't need to try it again. Yeah. Uh, I actually enjoy the seaweed shochus because seaweed is where we get umami. That's where MSG was discovered, right? So you, when you drink seaweed shochu, you get this umami bomb. And if you really want to understand what umami is, that's a great way to explore it. 
because there's not much else going on in that drink. Um, so it's just a fascinating category. Obviously, Christopher and I have uh, gone in deep and we hope lots of other people will follow us and, and explore this. I mean, if you think about the, you've got three different koji, you do have all different strains of yeast that can be used. You've got the local water source, which we didn't even touch on water. Uh, you've got fermentation time and temperature. You've got your, what kind of rice? There's over, over 100 varieties of rice in Japan. Uh, there's over 50 varieties of sweet potatoes used for shochu production. There's two row barley, six row barley. So all of these different ingredient considerations, fermentation time and temperature, dis distillation type if you're using a vacuum still Ooh. or yes. an atmospheric still, or you can do a, you can actually, some of the distilleries will put a partial vacuum on it so that it's, it's in between the two. You can also start blending. There's the aging, there's the filtration, there's the dilution. It's, it, I often call it the craft beer of spirits because it is so diverse. There's so many different directions you can go in what you're making. There are millions of potential combinations of all of those things that I just talked about to create these drinks. And you, you're just always learning something new and discovering a new flavor. Um, there's a brand, another one, I'm just gonna pop it out. I can find the bottle. It's called the banana. Now this oh, yeah. is not made with bananas. Bananas are not an improved ingredient. In fact, I'm allergic to bananas. <laughs> but it, this is a sweet potato shochu, but because of the yeast that they use, you get the, the aroma of um, like those, the fake banana candy, right? It's like the chemical can banana candy taste that we're used to from our childhoods. Um, and I haven't, I haven't consumed a lot of it because I don't really like those banana candies, but it's a fun expression, right? Some distillery decided to, to try it and they made it. And, uh, Christopher, you have one, you've got the pink, is that right? I oh, the pink, yeah. Jeez. Um, and it's very pink, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this one, this is another you know, experimentation with, with specialty yeast strains and low fermentation temperatures. So yeah, really there's, and, and it's interesting too, because the, the industry, you know, this has been hitting the sake industry for a long, longer time. The demographically, there's just uh, folks in this country just don't drink as much as they used to and new markets are necessary. And, you know, the, the shochu industry is, becoming more creative all of this all of a sudden and or all of a sudden and it's very very exciting to see all of the new expressions that are coming out some of them like the banana are things that you'll try once and be like oh that is definitely banana and i'm not sure i need to drink a whole lot more of that but it was very interesting and then other stuff is just you know you get some you get home runs in there as well um one of my favorite ones recently was a a barley shochu made in kagoshima kagoshima is not known for barley shochu but it's it's super chocolatey. It's it's mm -hmm. like coffee and chocolate, and it's 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 a roast. They roast the barley, and it just it comes at you like oh my, jeez, it's really fascinating. And they they uh, you know they hit one out of the park. Hey guys, um, we had a question from Spirited Tracy uh, asking about the the ratios of the aromatic ingredients to the to the rice. Oh, great question. Yeah, that varies by brand. Um, the, the highest mash bill of the aromatic that I've heard of is 10% of, of the total fermentation. And it, it's not actually always rice. Sometimes these will be barley fermentations that have the aromatic added. And sometimes it's rice. It really depends on what, what they're going for. I believe with the mizu, I think the green tea is 100% rice. Well, 90% rice and 10% green tea. The lemongrass, if I'm not mistaken, is rice and barley. I might have those two reversed, um, but it really varies by what they're trying to express uh, because the, the rice and the barley obviously will still add some character to the distillate. But it usually, I think I've heard as little as 1% for something that's really, really pungent, uh, but up to about 10% will be the aromatic. And typically the aromatic is added toward the end of the second fermentation. It's almost considered a third fermentation um, because you just want to capture those aromas before it starts. You know, if you're throwing fresh green tea or fresh shiso leaves or something like that into a fermentation, they could spoil, right? They could start to rot 
So you really want to just put them in long enough to capture the aromas. So it's typically two or three days before distillation that those aromatics will go in to the fermentation. Because of the lower ABV, does shochu have a shelf life? I would say no, generally. Um, I mean, really, because it's distilled, it's inert, right? You've, you've killed everything. There's nothing that's going to turn it off. The one exception, though, is because of the residual fatty acids, the residual oils that are in the bottle. And I mentioned earlier with Yamato Zakura, with that specific brand, if you keep it in a cold temperature, you're going to get these clouds of fats floating in the glass or in the, in the bottle. Um, those oils could turn rancid. And so what you'll often see bartenders do, and I, I tend to do this with my home bar as well, is when you get ready to pour a, pour a bottle or pour a glass, I just tilt, I just rinse, I rinse the glass because it'll capture all those oils that we're collecting on the surface. And some uh, lightly filtered shochu or even unfiltered shochu will have a lot of oil in it. You will see oil condensation in the neck or any empty part of the glass. And some of them you can eat, it's almost like, you know, when you drink a beer and you have the rings, if it's a nice fresh, beer, you've got the rings in your glass as you finish. The shochu bottles will do that as well. You can see where the pour marks are from previous pours because of where the oils settle. Uh, looks like Christopher was searching for a bottle. I was, looking, I was looking for a good clear bottle that had a bunch of the marbling at the top, but I just, I drink I, I that stuff too quickly. <laughs> I asked that question because I had a rum distiller once tell me that, you know, rum can get kind of stale after, after let's say you've opened it and you have a half bottle and it's been there a year that it can actually take on a, a stale lose, lose yeah. some of its life. Absolutely. Certainly some of these, yeah, some of these shochu that Stephen just mentioned that are very, very lightly filtered. And we're talking about, you know, maybe through a filtered through a badminton racket or something. It's, it really is, uh, it's a brand by brand consideration, but some of them can lose their vivaciousness. They lose their brightness and you get a lot of makers who will not sell it to distributors they're not convinced can can sell it on to the consumer very very quickly it's almost like it's it's like a it's a spirit but it needs to be treated like a Beaujolais Nouveau almost it's it needs to be consumed now basically to really understand it and to get it at its peak and we know we have friends in the industry uh makers mostly Stephen and I are you know our friends are mostly the the producers they refuse to let it out of the distillery unless they're certain that the folks that it's going to reach are the ones who understand that, oh, this, this is really of this month. This is, a, this is a September drink. It needs to be enjoyed now, and then it needs to be gone until the next vintage. And it's kind of, it's remarkable that a spirit is bottled and consumed in that, in that way, but it's not uncommon. Uh, Hopefully we've is, created a rabbit hole for some of you, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, and easier on the body than drinking sake. Is there any truth to that? If so, any particular reason why? Um, I, I think Stephen and I will say, first and foremost, and the industry will tell you that you cannot get a hangover from drinking shochu. I wholeheartedly disagree. I, <laughs> I can show you how to create a hangover if you want. I, I will guide you. <laughs> um, having said that, and Stephen, as the scientist, you can um, probably, it, it's more, um, it has a bit more weight coming from you than it comes from me, but what's the general way of breaking I mean, this down? What's the two, two minute elevator pitch on this? Sure. I, anytime you've got, you're combining sugars and alcohol, you're, you're, you're giving your liver double duty. And obviously we all become accustomed to what we love. I'm sure many of you no longer, or it's more difficult for you to get a hangover from wine, but you also know people who have one glass and have a headache the next day, right? And part of it is just our liver's capacity to process alcohols and sugars. And so obviously alcohol, drinking alcohol is not a healthy endeavor, but there are healthier options. You take that back. <laughs> and I think drinking distilled spirits, I tend to, especially drinking the vacuum distilled shochus. When I drink vacuum distilled shochu, I can session shochu all night and I'll, I might be tired the next day, but I don't have a hangover. I'm not like, I wish I could be back in bed. I don't want to eat. I don't want to look at food, any of those sorts of experiences, but it really has to do with how your body is breaking down those essential 
essentially poisons that are left over after the metabolites from, from alcohol and sugar. And so that's why a night of cocktails can be lethal. Um, you know, wines, beers, and sakes all have natural sugars in them. Fortunately, they're natural, uh, but you can still have that same effect. And sake has very high glucose content. Uh, so in Japan, if you're, you go to the doctor and he says, it looks like you're pre-diabetic, no more sake, you better switch to shochu. Doctors in Japan won't tell you to stop drinking. Yeah, they won't. That's not on the agenda. Um, a lot of it, even today, a lot of Japanese taxation is, is through alcohol taxes. So they're sure. never going to tell you don't drink, but they will tell you to switch to healthier alcohols. In fact, a friend of Christopher and I, his, uh, his dentist suggested he switch to shochu because it's better for his teeth. I don't know where that information comes from. I have never heard that before, but that was a very interesting anecdote. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, awesome. So there is a also, sense that should... Oh. Yeah, I mean, and for, you know, basically a lot of people here will tell you, you know, you say, oh, you're a shochu guy. And there's like, and then they'll say gout. Uh, basically anyone who has gout, the doctor will immediately say, well, if you're drinking, then it's naturally going to be shochu because it won't cause any, any flare ups. Um, and, you know, this is showed you the thing that showed you really has going for it in you know there's no res residual sugars after distillation there's no additives so there's no extra sugars added to it and it you know therefore it's the lowest calorie you know mass produced spirit in the world i think it's a obviously there's 25 percent alcohol and you've got seven seven milligrams of out of you know seven kilocalories per gram of alcohol so it's naturally going to be lower but there's no additives um and uh, you can go to kampai.us this is a fascinating article that steven wrote years ago um called the shochu diet where he actually um switched his alcohol intake from his beloved you know full-bodied red wines and craft beers to shochu and didn't change anything else and watch the pounds melt away over a period of how long was it, Stephen? Six months or so? Well, it's 15 pounds in seven months. And, yeah. And, and all you, I did you, was switch to shochu over it. That shows you how much I was drinking. But <laughs> uh, the, the uh, yeah, it, and the other, the other aspect actually, especially in sweet potato shochu, is it's got an enzyme that helps prevent blood clots. So there's actually oh. been uh, yeah. scientific medical research done in Japan that's demonstrated the, the health benefits of some of these drinks. And, uh, and it, for example, it, shochu actually lowers blood sugar. Um, from, a, from a blood sugar perspective, it's healthier to drink shochu than water uh, because it will, it will reduce your blood sugar more. So there, is, uh, there are health benefits to it. Obviously, everything in moderation, as I said at the top. Uh, drinking alcohol is not a healthy activity, but um, there are healthier options. And I think shochu is certainly one of them. Well, guys, that was, that was amazing. Fantastic. Um, and I think I think I speak for everybody and uh, how much I enjoyed this. And I think we all did. Um, if are there any other questions before we let these guys go? I, I, I know we uh, try to field some of your questions, but if there's this is last call, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and Stephen and I are are always available online. You can hit us on Twitter or Instagram. We're happy to, you know, go down all rabbit holes there. And all the tasting kits that we gave out, uh, they got a copy of your bios and your Twitter, all your handles and emails, I believe, are in that as well. Okay, great, great. Well, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And please give a listen to our new, brand new Japan Distilled podcast, if, if you're a podcast listener. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you again, um, guys. And uh, this was wonderful. And... Um, if, uh, if anybody is wondering, this um, has been recorded and we're going to post it. Uh, you, can, you can contact us about, it's going to be on the Japanese embassy. I'm not sure where maybe Miwa or Ren can tell us, but Miwa, this will be on, this will be, a, this recording will be available on the embassy website. Is that right? Yeah, like as we talked before, like you give me the recording and we can put it on our YouTube channel. Fantastic. Great. Well, thanks again, gentlemen. Um, but you, just the beginning of your day, uh, our day is coming to an end here, but uh, really enjoyed this. Thank you. It was it, a lot of fun. It's been, 
been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you very much, everyone, for your for your time, attention, and questions. It was it's always it really is uh, something that Stephen and I look forward to most in our day, talking to people who are curious and care about you know beverage alcohol and have the potential to teach others. So please tell your friends. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, good night, everybody. I'm gonna I'm gonna in the, the recording and thank you so much.